Many people who have gone to work for NASA or Caltech or any other scientific learning institution, and well, even the medical field, for example, I can even tell you one story where DeForest Kelly was told that a young man became a doctor all because of Dr. McCoy himself and his compassion mm -hmm. towards others mm -hmm. and treating others. And Perfect. I think I remember... I remember maybe a few episodes of the original Star Trek where, you know, they would go into the sick bay and it was like, you know, automatic arms were coming over and, you know, shooting down and, and healing wounds and stuff. And we're getting to that point now uh, mm -hmm. with uh, our medical technology. Exactly. As a matter of fact, I would like to point out that the, the diagnostic uh, medical beds that were shown in the original series, the United States military has conducted a field study into such medical devices for curing um, people and monitoring their yeah, life size they're, in they're, general. They're either making the machines or they have made the machines that are going to be basically doing brain surgery. Mm -hmm. Because it can be set, you know, that. so so per precisely and everything. And of course, if you think of that in your mind, if you see it in your mind, you go right back to Star Trek, you know, because right. they were capable of of that type of, uh, you know, medical attention. Absolutely, absolutely. Even right down to the hypo spray itself that Dr. McCoy had used, there there been um, uh, studies that have looked into the use of such hyper sprays becoming uh, a reality. And I guess in some I guess we I guess when you get right down to it, we owe a lot of a lot of our the ideas of such technology to to the original Star Trek. We owe a great deal yeah. to that. Yeah, and another aspect of uh, life imitating art, of course, the space shuttle program itself, at least partly inspired by Trek and the first shuttle of course being the Enterprise. And all of the uh, original actors, as you'll recall, were there uh, when the Enterprise was brought out at the ceremony. Mm hmm Back in 1976, um, when Leonard Nimoy, DeForest Kelly, James Doohan, and all the rest, except for Bill Shatner, he was not there uh, for reasons I don't recall, but they were there when the Space Shuttle Enterprise was unveiled at Edwards during uh, a ceremony. And what's interesting is that the name for the shuttle came from all the fans writing letters to President Gerald Ford at the time and, as I recall, NASA, saying we want our first spacecraft named after the Enterprise. And, that, and that's what they got. A very historical day. A lasting cultural imprint that continues today and will continue onward, no doubt. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I I think Star Trek really, really has been a powerful motivator in all types of fields, be it science, medicine, technology, uh, right down to even arts and entertainment. <laughs> it really has been a very powerful motivator and inspiration, and it has inspired many to create wonderful things and inspire the imagination. Or for lack of a better description, the, it inspires to cultivate our mind and develop our intellects for for the good of for the good of everybody in the world. Uh Whoopi Goldberg was inspired by uh, Lieutenant Uhura and if you recall the story you might uh, Christopher uh recount for us the experience where uh where Nichelle Nichols met uh Martin Luther King at a cocktail party and a, and a little exchange that they had. Mm hmm This was during the time, during Star Trek's first season, and Michelle Nichols, for reasons um, uh, will probably be only known to her, she was contemplating leaving Star Trek, and she met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at a social function, and but as, as it turns out, um, somebody introduced Dr. King to Michelle, and Dr. King told Michelle, he said, we, we can't thank you enough for representing us on the show. It's it's really wonderful. And Michelle was very flattered, and she did confess, though, that she had thought about 
leaving the show, and Dr. King said, no, you cannot leave. You cannot. What you've done today has been an inspiration for many and a stepping stone for all of us in our fight for civil rights. you become a role yeah, I've heard, model. I've heard that story, or I read about it. Mm-hmm. And because because of that, she she stayed on the show, and she later confessed to Gene Roddenberry that whole story, and Gene Roddenberry started crying, and he said, thank God somebody knows what I'm trying to do here and understands it. <laughs> and hence, that's why Star Trek has been so successful, the, the morality tales. It's essentially science fiction, a science fiction morality tale. And were, were were they were was it uh, Shatner and uh, Nichelle that uh, had the first uh, black white online or on uh, television kiss? Yeah, yeah, I believe I believe it was yes. Back in 1968, yeah, that, was, in the... that was a very moving episode. Very moving. Very. Uh, I don't know. It was just stunning. It was real it, stunning. Of course, you know I was a kid. You know. <laughs> Hey, it, it really, truly was. It was history in the making for for um, network television at the time, breaking down that one boundary. And even though Plato's stepchildren, um, the name of the episode where that occurred, it was controversial on some other levels. It really, it really changed the way television was made and done forever, and it set a whole new standard and. The people behind the episode, as well as Roddenberry himself, they, they're to be commended for taking that next step and taking such a huge risk. Because the political social climate, as we all know, in the late 60s was very, unfortunately, very unstable. turbulent. Yeah, very yeah, unstable. Very unstable. Many, kind of like today. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Many were wondering back in the 60s if they were going to live to see 30 or even beyond that with the way things were going but it it certainly changed a lot of a lot of um a lot of things at that time hey caller on the line from california good evening california hi good evening how you doing hello there. doing great do you have a question or a comment for christopher yeah. dalton we're discussing star trek star trek yes the alien <laughs> like star trek is based on one is it based like what like the lost Bible? Like how they look? Like the book of Enoch. Like when you watch Star Trek and the book that um Enoch describes how some of the aliens look. They were pale. They had white golden hair. I mean white golden hair. White and, golden hair. Yeah. The book um, of Enoch the book of Enoch describes Certain types of movies, even some from Star Trek. Mhm. White Golden. Um, are you are you trying to figure out what? I'm not certain I understand your question, ma'am. Can you can you repeat it again? Yes. Go ahead and clarify that question if you would for us, caller. Hello. Yeah, I, I think she I think she hung maybe up. We, but... Maybe we lost her. Um, yeah, it sounded like it would have been an interesting question. I also had some difficulty uh, under understanding it. I think she was yeah. talking about color or hue. I don't know if she was talking about. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Hello? I say it's proof. Yes, it's proven scientific that everything that related to the lost Bible, they bring it in into movies. That's all I'm just saying. I just want to know if it's true or not because, like. When you go into the lost Bible, they describe to all these aliens, these gods, or who was here, or what, how they look, and then they put it into the scientific movies, even Star Trek, to describe what they look like in the Bibles, or before time when they was here on Earth, because they live upon us on Earth, and people just don't realize, realize that. Uh-huh. I think many writers you, of Star Trek... Because Harvard, Harvard University, they talk about it. Even Berkeley talk about it, how aliens live on Earth. I think I, I, think I understand what you're trying to describe, man. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a good question. 
Rich, what 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 do you think? I think think that writers uh, are are many, many times inspired by many, many sources. And I think there's been a long-standing belief, at least during the past century, uh, that that we have been visited perhaps by extraterrestrials, and who knows? You know, the way our government covers up things, who knows about Area 51? It, it's quite possible that they know things, that there has been contact with other alien cultures, and that there are advanced races out there. And Roddenberry saw that, and, and Star Trek is all about us reaching out. Uh, new life, new civilizations, uh, and that's that's what the whole theme of Star Trek is, is to embrace the universe. So if there are others here, I hope that they mean well. Uh, if, in mm-hmm. fact, we have been visited, you know, and I hope that if, if our government ever does come clean about alien contact, that it will be of a, a peaceful and cordial nature, and, and we can definitely be optimistic and hopeful the way Gene Roddenberry was. Absolutely. What you just mentioned, what you just mentioned, though, um, the, in the episode Who Mourns for Adonis, um, as well as the animated episode uh, How Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth, the, the uh, concept of extraterrestrials visiting Earth before and Earth's past had had been addressed in those two and both were both dealt with that topic very very brilliantly I might add in in terms of um I guess you could say how such aliens created such various mythologies when after having visited Earth in general and how they could have influenced cultures and well, so on and so forth Assignment Earth even addresses the idea of alien intervention in modern times uh, with mm-hmm. Gary Seven. You know, and that's also something very, very interesting. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the concept from Assignment Earth, um, the idea that extraterrestrials have visited Earth to, in order to protect Earth, if not help mankind evolve for the better and become a more mature species. It's it's an interesting concept, one that was even addressed in the, the science fiction classic, the, the Day the Earth Stood Still. Simon Earth drew a lot from of that from that film, and the results were, were, were quite brilliant. I mean, who's to say whether or not aliens have, are, are here on Earth or have visited Earth and have tried to prevent mankind from destroying itself and try to have it evolve into something better and nobler than it, than it ever was. It's an intriguing concept, one that one that's very, very fascinating, no pun intended. <laughs> and, and Roddenberry certainly has given us an optimistic, optimistic vision of the future that I hope all of us can, can hang on to. Absolutely. Especially in these times we live in, hopefully such a future... Such a future will happen. Hopefully, hopefully it'll help improve the social, political climate of the world. If not, improve mankind, may improve it for the better. I mean, there's the, we live in a very violent world right now, and there is a day that goes by that we're dealing with such problems on such levels, and hopefully. Many years, if not many centuries from now, things will get better for all of us. And hopefully Star Trek will continue to point us in the right direction. And Christopher, as our uh, caller from Illinois has left and California has also hung up, I want to thank you very much on that optimistic note uh, for being uh, a guest again tonight. And Christopher, I'd like to have you back again in the future. Thanks. I like that. Now, thanks for having me back on. I, I enjoyed enjoyed our show tonight. I, I look forward to our next one. And I, I would also like, like in conclusion, uh, wish everybody, every Star Trek fan, a happy 50th anniversary in the celebration of Gene Roddenberry's original Space Odyssey. And as Spock would say, live long and prosper. Absolutely. May you all live long and prosper. Good evening, all. Good night. Good night. Heavy-handed. <laughs> well, what, what can I say? I mean, the Omega Glory was a heavy-handed episode, but well. Uh, Speaking of, of which, uh, as I recall correctly, correctly, both Omega Glory and Tholian Webb for sure were up for uh, awards, and, and I'm pretty sure Tholian Webb is the one that, that got the award. I, I liked yep. Omega Glory actually. I thought they were both fantastic. 
Tholian's one of my favorite too. Yo, go ahead. I, I did too. I, I enjoyed the Omega Glory mostly because it was it was an allegory to the Vietnam War, right. which was raging at the time. But it also introduced us to another starship, the Exeter, and its captain, who was played brilliantly by Morgan Woodward. And yeah. the, the character he played was a good man who was unfortunately driven insane by the loss of his ship and his crew and his inability to protect them from forces that, unfortunately, he could not prevent from happening. And it, it really, I find it funny, though, that many people consider the character of Ron Tracy a villain, maybe on some levels, but when you get to the, the real crux, the real nuts and bolts, Ron Tracy is just a tragic character, a good man who went insane. And Absolutely. I mean, what, and what, what, what leader wouldn't lose his marbles after losing people he had worked with so closely? I mean, Commodore Matthew Decker went through the same thing in the Doomsday Machine. And, of course, uh, Captain Garth, Garth of Izar, whom you mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And to some extent, to a lesser degree, Merrick, uh, who was a cowardly figure, of course, Merrick on uh, Bread and Circuses on the uh, the Roman uh, <laughs> yeah. planet, as you recall. That, that's another uh, fallen uh, character. I don't think he ever made it to the starship captain as i recall he was on a freighter ship or something but uh but merrick would also fit in that same uh, motif yeah yeah rm rm merrick um he he did fit into that motif a little bit um supposedly yeah he was a captain of a merchant vessel the ss beagle if he hadn't as i understand it, if he hadn't failed a certain psych test in Starfleet Academy, he would have had a starship of his own, like the Enterprise. Yes, indeed. But uh, back to your original question. Um, aside from that script I had written, yeah, I've written some other uh, Star Trek fan fiction. Villain, but, um, uh, he, this person was a villain, nonetheless, and the nastiest, and that was the Gorgon from the episode And the Children Shall Lead. Yeah, that that's one of the most chilling episodes uh, oh, of all. Man. That you really feel, you feel and experience palpable fear watching that. That that really sticks with me. That episode it always has. It it is it is a very dark episode for 1968. It really, it really truly was a very dark episode. Very powerful. And very sad at the same time because those young kids, they were being used by the Gorgon. And then when they finally are confronted with how evil this character was, this evil life force that took the lives of their own parents. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It, it, that, I'm, I'm telling you, that spoke volumes. And the way it ended when they saw pictures of their parents lying dead oh god let me tell you the lives of all children i mean every children is our business in terms of grown-ups protecting children and children should not have to being a parent uh, myself I'm a california attorney melvin bella who was <laughs> yeah. uh, Bella had defended Jack Ruby, the uh, the guy who shot Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, so Bella had quite a legal career before he played the Gorgon. <laughs> <laughs>